So we are very happy to have uh, Lauren Williams talking about the magic number conjecture for them equals to amplitohedron and Park Taylor identities. Please, Lauren. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much to the to the organizers for organizing this nice conference and inviting me. Getting stuck. Sorry. You go to the next slide. Sorry. Oh uh, yes. Oh. Here. It should work now. Sorry. Okay. So this is joint work with Matteo Parisi, who's here, Melissa Sherman Bennett, who's not, and Ron Tesler as well. So let me give you a brief overview of my talk. I will start by telling about some combinatorial objects called tricolored subdivisions and partial cyclic orders, and explain how these objects are connected to Park Taylor identities and uh, Park Taylor polytopes. And then I'm going to explain how this combinatorial story is related to the amplitudehedron. And um, in particular, how we can use this combinatorics to prove the magic number conjecture for the amplitudehedron when n is equal to two. Okay, so I'm gonna start just completely combinatorially. So a tricolored subdivision tau of an n-gon is a subdivision of the polygon into smaller polygons into three colors, they will be black, gray, or white, in which every edge connects two vertices of the n-gon. So here's an example of a tricolored subdivision of, of, a, of an octagon. And now from every tricolored subdivision tau, we can read off what's called a cyclic order. This is a cyclic analog of a partial order. And to get this cyclic order, we read the vertices of our white polygons clockwise, and we read the vertices of the black polygons counterclockwise, and we ignore the gray. So I'm going to explain this with an example. So the cyclic order that I would get from this example requires that 2, 5, 7 are circularly ordered. That 2, 5, 7 comes from my white polygon, red clockwise. We also require that 5, 7, 6 is circularly ordered. This comes from reading the black triangle counterclockwise. And we require that 1872 um, is circularly ordered, and that comes from the black quadrilateral, red counterclockwise. Okay, and now a circular extension of this cyclic order is a total circular order on the numbers one through eight that's compatible with my cyclic partial order. So for example, a circular extension of the C tau in my picture is two, five, one, eight, seven, six, three, four. And you should think of these numbers, say, as the numbers, um, placing these numbers around a circle. And then you can see that if I place these numbers around a circle, we'll see two, five, seven in order, we'll see five, seven, six in order, and we'll see one, eight, seven, two in order. So this is one of many possible circular extensions of this um, cyclic order. Okay, so now um, let me remind you of the definition of the Grassmannian. Um, the Grassmannian GKN is the set of all k-dimensional subspaces of an n-dimensional vector space, and I'll represent elements by full rank k by n matrices. So this is an example of a, a G24 um, element. And then our Plucher coordinates are the minors, the, the maximal minors of these matrices. So if I is a K element subset of one through N, my Pluger coordinate P sub I is the minor of the K by K submatrix of C um, located in the columns I. Okay, so now I want to explain how we can get some Grassmannian identities and in particular some Park Taylor identities from the tricolored subdivisions I showed a moment ago. Okay, so given a permutation W, written as a list of numbers, W1 through WN, we define our Park-Taylor function, PT of W, to be this rational function, which is one over the product of these Pluker coordinates, W1, W2, W2, W3, and so on, up through WN, W1. And you can see that I'm only caring about uh, my permutation up to the cyclic order on W1 through WN. And now we get an identity that goes as follows. So if you give me a tricolored subdivision with at least one gray polygon, and if we let C tau be the corresponding cyclic order, then 
the sum of the Park-Taylor factors, PT of W, where I sum over all circular extensions of my partial order equals zero. So I'm going to illustrate this with a tiny, tiny example. Okay, here's the tiniest non-trivial example. Here's a tricolored subdivision of a foregone. I have the numbers one through four on my polygon, and I have a, I've divided my, my polygon into a gray triangle and a white triangle. And my, um, what I require from this picture is that I must see the numbers one, two, three in order. And I don't care, I don't care about four. So the, the permutations, the, the, the circular extensions of this partial order are one, two, three, four, one, two, four, three, and one, four, two, three. These are the permutations where when we restrict to the numbers one, two, and three, we see them in order. And then the, then the theorem says that the sum of these Park-Taylor factors equals zero. And um, for people who are familiar with the Pluker relations on the Grassmannian, if you clear denominators in this identity, you'll get exactly the three-term Pluker relation. Okay, so this is a combinatorial framework where we can um, see a bunch of identities for Park-Taylor Park, Park -Taylor factors. Um, let me just mention, so we already saw some reference to Park-Taylor in, in the talk of Berndt earlier. So these are related to the cohomology of M0n and scattering equations. They're related to Lie polynomials. They're related to non-planar playback graphs. And, um, and one can derive from the theorem above the well-known U of 1 decoupling identities and the, and the shuffling identities. And I'll just mention that, that in the mathematics literature, there's some analogous results for linear extensions of, of posets as well. Okay. Now, I want to give a, um, a more kind of geometric interpretation of these tricolored subdivisions as well. So, so we can define a polytope associated to each tricolored subdivision. And, um, and we do that as follows. I'm going to associate a whole bunch of inequalities to this tricolored subdivision. So, so for any compatible arc, i to j, I'll tell you what that is in a moment, we read off this inequality, which is an inequality involving xi plus xi plus one plus dot 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 plus xj minus one. And we have a, a lower bound and an upper bound for this sum of x's. So here a compatible arc is an edge of a polygon in my tricolored subdivision, or it lies entirely inside a black or white polygon. And these quantities area of i to j and gray area of i to j is roughly speaking how many black or gray triangles that you see to the left of your arc i to j. So, um, so just as an example, two to seven is a compatible arc in this tricolored subdivision, and it gives rise to this following inequality, saying that x2 plus dot 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 through x6 has a, a lower and an upper bound. Okay, so the main thing to take away is that to every tricolored subdivision, we have a natural construction of a polytope. Okay, and so I've explained how every tricolored subdivision tau gives rise to two things, a partial cyclic order and also a polytope. And a second theorem that, that we can prove is that if you look at this Park-Taylor polytope that we've associated to a tricolored subdivision, it has this triangulation into unit simplices, and these simplices are indexed by all of the circular extensions of the corresponding partial order. And so in particular, the normalized volume of this polytope equals the number of circular extensions of the cyclic order. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so, so far I've just presented you a purely combinatorial framework of tricolored subdivisions, and we can read off from that a partial cyclic order, we can prove some Park-Taylor identities, and we can also uh, construct a polytope, and its polytope has volume um, dictated by circular extensions. Okay, so next I'm going to switch gears and tell you about the amplitudehedron, and then, uh, um, explain how all of this combinatorics is closely connected to the amplitudehedron. So maybe I should just 
see if there's any question before I switch gears. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, right. This is so. This is just a list of some some related works on on polytopes. Okay. So in order to tell you about the amplitudehedron, I want to just review my notation for the Grassmannian. So this is our Grassmannian GKN, and we have our Plucker coordinates. And associated to a um, to any full rank K by N matrix C, we have a matroid. So what's the matroid? The matroid is associated to my matrix C is the set of all K element subsets of one through N where the corresponding Plucker coordinate is non-zero. Okay, so back in 1987, Gelfond, Goreski, McPherson, and Serganova introduced the matroid stratification of the Grassmannian. And this is just the idea that given any collection of K element subsets of one through N, I can just say, let's look at the subset of elements in the Grassmannian where my Plucker coordinates are non-zero, if and only if they come from that collection. So this just gives us a natural way to decompose the Grassmannian into strata. Now, famously, the topology of these strata is, is, is terrible. There's a famous theorem called the Minyoff's universality theorem that says that the topology of these pieces is as bad as any algebraic variety. Okay. On the other hand, if you introduce the adject adjective positive into the picture, everything becomes beautiful. Um, so, so work of Lustig, Reach, and Posnikoff um, initiated the study of, of, of positivity for the Grassmannian. And so now we're going to look at the subset of the real Grassmannian where we require that all Plucker coordinates, so all of our maximal minors, are non-negative. And inspired by this matri matri matroid stratification, one can partition this positive Grassmannian into pieces based on which Plucker coordinates are positive and which are zero. So if M is a subset of the K element, so if M is a collection of K element subsets of one through N, we can let S of M be the set of all elements in the positive Grassmannian where my Plucker coordinate is strictly positive if and only if I belongs in the collection. And otherwise that Plucker coordinate will be zero. So in contrast to this terrible topology of, of matroid strata, these pieces have the nicest possible topology. They're, they're cells, they're just open balls. And so we have this nice cell decomposition of the positive Grassmannian into what are called positroid cells. And there's a whole you know, beautiful classification of these cells um, given by uh, equivalence classes of playback graphs or on-shell diagrams. And, um, and then um, maybe 10 years after the introduction of the positive Grassmannian, um, Nimar Kanihamed and Yaroslav Trinka introduced this object called the amplitudehedron. So if we fix positive numbers n, k, and m, and if we let z be a positive n by k plus m matrix, then we can use this matrix to give a map from the positive Grassmannian of K planes and N space into the Grassmannian of K planes and K plus M space. And this map is just matrix multiplication. You take your K by N matrix C and you map it to the span of C times Z. So that's what I'll call the amplitudehedron map. And then the amplitudehedron itself is the image of the positive Grassmannian under the amplitudehedron map. So this is some subset of the Grassmannian of K planes in K plus M space. Okay. So I think probably most people here have seen the definition of the amplitudehedron and, and heard about the background, but I'll just mention that, um, that the motivation, motivation came from giving a geometric interpretation of the BCFW recurrence and, um, and was inspired by this observation of, of Hodges that in some cases, the amplitude could be interpreted as the volume of a, of a polytope with spurious poles arising from internal boundaries of a triangulation of the polytope. And, um, and he asked if, if you can understand such a picture more generally. 
and um, Nima and Yara found the amplitohedron as the answer to this question. And then this BCFW recurrence gets interpreted as a triangulation or a, or a tiling of the amplitohedron, particularly for, this is for m equals, m equals four. Um, but of course the amplitohedron makes sense for, for any m. Okay, so this is just a review. I'm just keeping up here my definition of, of amplitohedron and then just mention that in special cases, the amplitohedron recovers the positive Grassmannian. When K is one and M is two, the amplitohedron is just equivalent to a polygon in ARP2. And for K is one in general M, we get a cyclic polytope. So it recovers very nice um, combinatorial objects. Okay, so, um, so I want to just explain um, what we mean when we say we want to triangulate or to tile the amplitohedron. So we have this positive Grassmannian, which is a cell complex. It's a disjoint union of these nice pieces called positroid cells that I'll index by, I'll, I'll refer to as S pi. And we also have this amplitohedron map, which is a continuous surjective map from the positive Grassmannian onto the KM dimensional amplitohedron. And um, you see the, the positive Grassmannian itself has dimension much bigger than the dimension of the amplitohedron. And so we'd like to understand the amplitohedron as an image of same dimensional cells in the positive Grassmannian. So since our amplitohedron has dimension K times M, we would like to look at KM dimensional cells in the positive Grassmannian and, and choose special KM dimensional cells um, whose images will, will tile our amplitohedron. Okay, so that motivates this definition. A tiling of the amplitohedron is a collection of closures of images of KM dimensional cells such that the amplitohedron map is injective on each one of those cells, in which case I'll call its image a tile. Moreover, the images of these cells um, should have union equal to the amplitohedron. And finally, we want the um, interiors of two distinct tiles to be pairwise disjoint. Okay, okay. And, and again, recall the, the motivation is that the volume of the amplitohedron computes scattering amplitudes. And the original paper of Neiman Yora conjectured that certain BCFW cells give rise to a tiling of the amplitohedron. Um, so this has since been proved in a standard case by Evan Zohar, Lecrec, and Tesler, and then generalized for all BCFW tilings uh, by them together with um, Melissa and Matteo and I. Okay, all right, so that's the notion of tiling. And now, um, already a number of years ago, uh, with Stephen Karp and Yan Zheng, we just looked at the, the numerology of these tilings. So this is a little table that, that we made. Um, so when m equals one, the cardinality of a tiling of the amplitohedron is this binomial coefficient n minus one choose k. When m is two, the cardinality is n minus two choose k. When m is four, you get this number one over n minus three, n minus three choose k plus one, n minus three choose k, which is a Neriana number, very famous number in combinatorics. And when m is even and uh, k is, is, is one, we get this binomial coefficient. And the explanation here is that this is the known size of, um, of a triangulation of a cyclic polytope. So we made this little, this little table and we tried to see the pattern and observed the following. So define M of A, B, C to be this triple product. So this is, this is a famous formula due to McMahon. And we observed that all of the known tilings of the amplitohedron when M is even have cardinality M of K comma N minus K minus M comma M over two. So this is, this is the number <laughs> that generalizes the special cases in the table on the previous page. And, uh, and so we'll call this the prediction 
that a tiling should have this size, the magic number conjecture. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is consistent with the known um, calculations in the cases m equals two, four, and k equals one. Something that's sort of intriguing is that this gives this this number, this formula m of ABC has a has a threefold symmetry between the parameters a, b, and c. And uh, one of these symmetries, the symmetry between k and n minus k minus m, is the well-known parity duality. Um, and this number m of a, b, c, I'll mention, has many beautiful combinatorial interpretations. So it counts non-crossing lattice paths in a rectangle. It counts plane partitions. It counts rhombic tilings. It counts perfect matchings of an appropriate graph. Um, so th these pictures here are all for the parameters a, b, and c. Okay, so anyway, so this is a beautiful number. Um, and uh, and so the, yeah, so the conjecture we made was that tilings should should have this size. And, uh, and so now um, with Matteo, Melissa, and Ron, we can prove this when m equals two. So in particular, we can show that all tilings of the amplitudehedron have size, this mag magic number, which is n minus two choose k. Just as a sanity check, if you take the special case where k equals one, this theorem uh, tells you that all triangulations of an n-gon have size n minus two. Good. <laughs> so we have a very fancy proof that all triangulations of an n-gon have size n minus two. Okay. Um, but the proof is not so bad, and, um, and it uses this combinatorics of, of bicolored subdivisions. So I'll just explain roughly how this, how this works. And um, actually, maybe before I tell you the ideas of the proof, I'll just tell you um, uh, sort of the vague idea, which is, and I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to say some stuff that's not true, but it will hopefully give the true idea. So if you wanted to show that all triangulations of a certain polytope had the same size, what you could imagine doing is first classifying all triangles of that polytope. And if one could then prove that all of the triangles had the same volume, then it would, of course, automatically follow that all triangulations must have the same size because the volume of the polytope is an invariant. Okay, so this, this is um, maybe what you can imagine trying to do. And this idea almost works, except instead of talking about volume, we have to talk about a different kind of invariant that we will associate to all of the tiles. Okay, so, so the first step is we need a classification of all tiles for the m equals two amplitudehedron. And this we had already done um, with a previous, in, a, in a previous paper of Parisi and Sherman Bennett. And we had classified the tiles and showed that they were exactly in bijection with bicolored subdivisions. And now, just, just as every Park-Taylor polytope has a decomposition into simplices where W ranges over circular extensions, we show that every tile has a canonical decomposition into W chambers. You can think of these as simplices, um, where W, again, ranges over certain circular ex extensions. And then we can use these decompositions to define a Park-Taylor function of the whole amplitudehedron and a Park-Taylor function of every tile. And we show that the Park-Taylor function of every tile is the same for all tiles. And then it, it, it follows then that every tiling of the amplitudehedron has the same size. And I'll just make um, a little remark for those who care about Eulerian numbers, that the total number of W chambers for the M equals two amplitudehedron is the Eulerian number. So our layer numbers have come up in a few different places in this sort of general field. We don't know of a connection of this Eulerian layer number to the other instances, but it would be interesting to see. Okay, so yeah, so these are the main ideas. And, um, and, and now in the next 
in the last uh, maybe four minutes, I can just say just a little bit more, for example, about our classification of tiles and coming from bicolored subdivisions. So, um, so as, as I mentioned, tiles for the amplitudron when m equals two are in bijection with bicolored subdivisions of an n-gon. And um, so I have a picture at the lower left. This is a bicolored subdivision. So I now will only have black and white polygons. So how can I read off a tile from that bicolored subdivision? Well, first I'm just going to explain how you get a cell. And how you can do that is choose your favorite triangulation of the black polygons. So here is one triangulation. And um, if you like on-shell diagrams or platygraphs, you can construct it as follows. If you don't know what they are, you can just ignore this third picture and just look at my matrix. So going from the middle figure with my triangulation allows us to go straight over to this matrix representation where every row will have three stars, exactly three stars. And the stars should be thought of as um, generic, generic, uh, generic real numbers. And this, um, this defines for us a cell of the positive Grassmannian whose image is a tile. Um, this, this matrix, by the way, is closely related to a matrix that appeared in Baron's talk um, previously. And uh, in fact, the one can express the entries of these matrices using Pluker coordinates, uh, so same labeling as he had. Okay, so, so anyway, so these pictures, these bicolored subdivisions, exactly give rise to the tiles for the m equals two amplitudehedron, and we can explicitly write down the cells just like this. Okay, um, let's see. I think I may only have one or two minutes. One minute, okay, all right. So I would have told you about chambers, but I'm just going to, to, to skip that. And, um, and I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll, so this is the slide where, where we explain how to get the Park-Taylor factor associated to any tile and to the amplitudehedron. And, um, and the, main, the, main idea, the main idea is to show that for every tile, its Park-Taylor Park function is this constant, um, this, this constant uh, has this constant value, minus one to the K times the Park-Taylor factor of the identity permutation. Okay, so thank you very much. And these are the, the two references. Thank you. Thank you very much for a nice talk. So uh, Nick, Nick has a question. Thanks a lot, very nice talk. Very, and I liked it very much. Um, about your uh, the uh, identities, the magic identities. Mm -hmm. You they... mean the Park Taylor identities from the yes. tricolored? Uh -huh. Exactly. Uh, so, those those similar identities came up a while ago. I, I was looking at such things, um, and uh, there 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 are a couple ways to extend them. In fact, one, and you can see that they're actually you can put a grading on a bigger. You can put a what? You can put a kind of grading on a bigger space, such that it's not zero, but it's it's a, actually a product of the triangles themselves. So it's, it's just related to McMullen's polytope algebra. Um, huh. Okay. But yeah, it's 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 actually. Just wanted to say, and it's secretly, maybe not zero, but something in the lower lower dimension of space. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, it would be good to talk. Yeah. yeah. But, I know one can get identities. From um, the non-planar playbook graphs in this paper of um, Yara, Jake, Nima, Postnikov, Freddie, maybe. Yeah. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been looking to try to to compare to see um, how those identities match up with ours. Yeah, it's related. Yeah. It's related. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. More questions. I have one generic question. So the statement about uh, the fixed number of terms in any triangulation, how kind of generic it is for polytops or things beyond? How surprising is the statement? I think it's kind of surprising. I'm I'm only aware of this being true for even dimensional cyclic polytopes. Okay. 
but in general, it's far from true. And for odd dimensional cyclic polytopes, it's not true. There's a sort of, mm -hmm. there is an upper bound, that, mm -hmm. yeah, which, uh, which is a number that um, looks like this magic number. Um, but I don't know of other polytopes besides the cyclic polytope that have oh, this property. So if you take a random polytope, it will be not true, most likely. Okay, interesting. Okay. Uh, any more questions, comments? We are out of time. So thank you, Lauren, again for a very nice talk. Mm -hmm.